Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Welcome back, everyone, to The Wilder Rye, where we are getting wilder by the minute, a podcast where we break down and celebrate the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. We are focusing on, for our inaugural season, Young Frankenstein. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Alan Sanders. And I'm your other host, Walt Murray. And joining us one more time, because he apparently is a glutton for punishment, we've got Jonathan Howell joining us from Minute Impossible. Jonathan, thanks for coming back and capping out the week with us. Hey, TGIF, everybody. Yeah, we should be... Where's our drinks? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess uh, I guess our host forgot to bring them. Dang it, where's it? We need an Inga. We need an Inga. Oh. <laughs> no, we need an uh, Igor. We need an Igor. Igor? <laughs> send him down to block. The problem is, is we'd send him out for like, you know, you know 17-year scotch, and we'd get like the bottom of the shelf $4 uh, Boone's Farm. Yeah. <laughs> no, we get it. He'd bring a kid back who's a 17-year-old named Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's plenty of room in the cart. Either way, if he drops the top shelf wagon. scotch, he's fired. <laughs> wagon. wagon. Yeah, there's a wagon I gotta f- I'm got. i falling off of here. <laughs> well, it is Friday. It is Friday, so I got the whole weekend to recover. You know what? As long as the word functional is in my title, I'm okay. Hey, you're doing good. Well, let's go ahead and introduce this minute here. And this particular minute starts off, minute 20, by the way, starts us off the remainder of the way with the dun, dun, dun music we got in the very opening title credits. We will hear that anytime there's something really super dramatic. And we start off with the, we finish with the push in onto the castle. And we will wrap up being introduced to yet another character. Apparently, we can assume a caretaker of some kind to the house and estate of Frankenstein. Frau Bluka. <laughs> Love Cloris Leachman. <laughs> well, before we jump to Cloris Leachman. Oh, well, we can jump all over. Why not? You know what? It's Friday. You know what? It's a free Let's for jump all, all over Cloris Leachman, please. <laughs> 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 Mr. Well, Leachman may not, may not appreciate that. But. You know, well, yeah, it, there takes all kinds out there, you know. Hey, I, I kind of like the person in charge type. I don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> She's definitely in charge. <laughs> Let's continue. This first shot here, when we first walk into minute 20, after we get past the castle, we do a dissolve into the coming into the courtyard of, or the entryway, I guess. I don't know. Is, how, do you think this is the front door or the back door? Do you think we're bringing you in through, like, the main entrance if you're having a ball at the castle of the Frankensteins? I think is this, this is where they the, fr- the main entrance. Because when they go in, we'll see that they're in a huge reception area, huge atrium, I guess, of some kind. So it's, it, it feels like the main entrance to me. We mm-hmm. don't get it, uh, Jonathan, we don't really get a sense, though, of what happens off or how large this area is because we come in through an archway of some kind, obviously leading up from, you know, the driveway of the Frankensteins leads into this archway, into this cobblestone or, or brick stoned, I don't know if we call it like front drive or front gathering area. But this is the exact same tracking shot that's in the opening title credits, save for the fact that now we've got the horse drawn hay wagon in the scene. Yeah, and it's probably, I mean, behind us, I can assume that we're in an enclosed area. You know, it is a castle, so everything was just concentric circles going smaller and smaller, because if you have a castle, you want to be able to, you know, fall back to the main gate. Repel the hoarders. The, you know, <laughs> you know they want to be able to push forward <laughs> or repel backwards. So, yeah, it's a it's probably a enclosed area, just big enough to where lots of different carts and wagons could come through and turn all the way around and go back out again. Here's a question, and Jonathan, I don't know how much experience you have uh, with like animal handlers or talking about animal handlers in movies, but it looks like Marty Feldman is doing the actual driving of the horses to where their heads are just off screen. I'm wondering, did the horses know to go to the animal handler or is he actually just hitting his mark? Because I always, I always wonder that with dealing with horses and you know, he, he, he looks like he's very comfortable steering horses. I think he, in those longer scenes uh, in the minute before when they were going through the jungle, jungle, when he goes through the forest earlier, he's definitely driving that team. I think at this point, it's such a small set. These horses were trained to stop when someone puts a, probably a hand signal up. So I have a feeling one of the horse's handlers is standing right off camera to the left. When they stop, he does pull on the reins. I bet these horses may not even be trained by reins. They're trained by signals. Rain training in, in, in horses probably doesn't work in all movies because the horse is expecting something to be either pulled or kicked or gently nudged. 
to move. But with hand signals, the horse understands what they're supposed to do. So I think what happens is the horse just walks up to a certain point and then some someone off stage puts their hand up or maybe even grabs the bridle. Because if you notice, their faces are a little bit off camera. Right. And that's what made so me he, bring that up. Someone may have just grabbed the bridles <laughs> and, and, and you know their trainer and they just stopped because, you notice they also don't whinny and they make no noise. So they're trained to not take over the scene. Well, the very next thing that happens is after these uh, animals come to a stop, we have what's going to be the setup of one of the, again, great jokes that everyone knows from this movie. Those are a huge set of door knockers <laughs> on the front door to Castle von Frankenstein. Yeah, they're like, what, two feet diameter? They may be the biggest knockers I've ever seen. <laughs> I haven't seen a set of knockers like that. Well, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's great about this joke. The easy joke is the size of them. And instead, he says, you know, what knockers? Yeah. And it's one of those jokes I would have gone for the easy joke of what big knockers. And instead, he just says, what knockers? Like, what a what a thing to see. <laughs> and, and it makes it a hundred times better as a joke. And this is an, another example of what Walt brought up. And I think, Jonathan, you've been commenting on this week. You hear the stereotypical horror movie sounds of the reverberating, menacing echo of these knockers going through the castle. It's mm -hmm. there's it's a creepy, the sound design, it's meant to be something you'd hear in a horror movie. This isn't where we hear, like the, the easy gag would be you have these big giant iron knockers and as it hits you hear like a, a squeak of a frog from like a kid's toy, like ee, 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 you know, th that would be a cheap joke. You hear boom, boom, like huge. And so we're not thinking of a joke right now. We don't even expect, we're just like oh my god who lives behind here kong because those don't look that big for the door they were smart they made the door huge exactly so why not have giant loops on them to you know and it works because you start thinking close. to yourself okay if this is a really really old you know maybe 16th 17th century castle that has been around for hundreds of years the only way to inform the people inside they don't have a doorbell so you need right. something like this big to reverberate through the castle so you don't even realize the jokes being set up just yet and that's what i love about this movie so many of the jokes they take their time to tell the joke or show the joke. It's not in your face. It's not the stupid, silly joke. It's actually a very well-written and timed thing that we go back and go, oh my God, that's why they're big knockers. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, and the way they set it up is it's a long, drawn-out, left-to-right pan instead of being a cut. I think a cut would have ruined the joke. I think if he'd hit the knockers and then they cut to them and him, Frankenstein, pulling Inga out of the cart, wagon, he would have <laughs> it would have ruined the joke, but the way they do it, they show the knockers. He knocks on them, turns to him. You see Frankenstein instead of looking at the woman whose bosom is in his face right now, he's looking at the knockers on the wall. <laughs> what I love is when it pans over, they had to get this gotten this timing just right because he's helping her out, and his face actually is initially looking into her chest. But again, he's not interested in her that way at this point in the movie. We've already established very quickly he's much more of the mentor or protector role. So as soon as he hears over his shoulder, which by the way, we've already heard three or four knocks, but somehow at this very moment as the camera's on him, he looks over his shoulder, he's helping her halfway down, stops, her chest is right hanging even with his face, but he looks over at the door, pauses, what knockers? And she's like, oh, thank you. She looks down for like she looks up at the door first, which is kind of funny. She it's almost like the actress. I don't know how many takes they must have done of this, but she does initially look at the door, but then looks down at her own chest and then has that sheepish <laughs> smile. Oh, thank, thank you, doctor. <laughs> It's a great joke. It is It is an awesome joke. It, and it, do you think she is talking about her own knockers? Or do you oh, think I she's think thanking she him for getting him out of the wagon? No, no I think it's, it's definitely her own knockers. And I think we get one more layer into Inga now. We've sensed the playful side. Right. We've been given a sense that she's a little more childlike and more honest. But now we realize, oh, she is aware of some of her sexuality. She she's it. aware of her how she looks. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And but but he at the same time, is clueless. She, well, he's clueless. But at the same time, when she makes that comment, she almost looks both like it's a compliment, but almost like it's a little like, oh, like oh, yeah. she's right. blushing almost as if right. it's like he complimented her hair. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Because for him, he, I think she noticed in the way I mean, the way he says it, it's he doesn't even notice he's saying it. No, he, like he's not saying it and then looking at her like as if he's now sheepish. Yeah, he's totally innocent in this uh, in this scene. And the fact is, we know this because of the way he acts here in just a second. He says when she says, oh, thank you, doctor. He looks back at her and goes, oh, okay. like she's he thinks she's thanking him for helping her down. Not for complimenting her bosoms. Yeah, and they just move on with the scene. Something that we've talked about here for the last 
uh, several minutes of this of, of this part of Young Frankenstein, the filmmakers, the editor, they knew to give us pauses because we're probably still laughing at the knockers joke when we get the very slow door opening, door creaking, and the reveal of Cloris Leachman. So it allows us to get the laugh out and then resettle ourselves to now a very creepy and ominous woman who is poking her head through the door. Yeah, and it it also kind of takes us back to, hey, just to remind you, we're kind of a monster movie. We're kind of a going back to the 1931 Frankenstein, and here's another kind of ominous, dark character that's appearing. The housekeeper scene. is always one of those tropes. You've got your you've got your lab assistant, you've got your Igor, and you always usually have someone that takes care of the house. Sometimes it's a butler. This time it happens to be a headmistress maid. I don't know what she would call herself. Girlfriend. She's a she's a frau. <laughs> well, don't so. give that away. <laughs> One of the things when she and I love this uh, the lighting of this shot is she comes out of darkness and as she comes into the scene she gets lit by the scene and never once does she have anything nice or warm. There is no genuine care of who's at her door. It's almost like this is the best she's going to do with the fact that mm-hmm. someone's interrupted her evening. And she knows that they're coming, so this is her being nice. Yeah, her being welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> and she has that kind of cold European housemistress feel to her. Well, her hair is pulled to one side. She's got the bun. She looks very uptight. Cloris Leachman, actually, this big wart on her face, was this was her idea. She actually went to makeup and, and came up with this idea. What's not in the script, Gene Wilder didn't suggest it. Mel Brooks didn't suggest it. And they were like, do you really want to do that? And she said, yeah, I just feel like this is her character. And she was given the latitude to make a a pretty big decision with how she looks as a character. That is a big decision for an actor to make. But it fits. It fits the character perfectly. And she always, you know, kind of melts into her roles anyway. So anytime she's, I mean, she's a beautiful woman and she's able to ugly herself up. You know, I'm doing quote marks, ugly herself up in this way that's comedic and also a character. It's not just the mole for mole's sake. It is funny in that she looks like any character from any of these older movies would exactly it fits it's it's not done just for a sight gag it really helps flesh the character out so in the space of literally the how long it took her to open the door her slow coming from the darkness into the light very purposeful very ominous in in basically the space of five seconds we we get a sense of who she is well and if they had been making a serious frankenstein movie she could have played the same role Mm -hmm. and you and know, she'd have played it totally straight and been fine. Totally straight and been creepy and fit the castle perfectly. I love her. Uh, I love Cloris Leachman. We've, my wife and I have been recently rewatching the Mary Tyler Moore show, and she's amazing as Phyllis. I, I love her. Just her acting chops are insane. For those that are you know younger, she's on The Facts of Life. She was on Mary Tyler Moore show. She does voiceover work. She was on um, Raising Hope recently. She's been doing a ton of work for like 70 years she's been in movies. I went and looked at her IMDb. It is so long. It's ridiculous. And those are like real movies. Like not just – I mean some of the early stuff was TV shows because that's what you get – you cut your teeth on. But she has been a force in movies and, and TV shows for the past 70 years, and she's hilarious. What I love about and still her – And still has her faculties and is still a witty lady. What I love about her – and you brought it up. She is actually and, – and through all these early movies, she is a, a very attractive woman. But she can play this plain or uh, or just almost like rough or hardened stern. or just very stern, almost unlikable characters to the point where you forget – who she is underneath. And that's what I think is the brilliance of a good actor when you forget who the person is underneath. And she has, and she has the, uh, she has a strong face. So her, she was able, you know, she's not angelic looking. So her beauty comes from a strikingness. And it's, I love, I love it when she's able to be any character she wants to be. It actually doesn't limit her as an actress. It allows her to be the, I mean, Phyllis on the Mary Tyler Moore show was the cute neighbor. That was like her, you know, in quotes, that would be next to her name when they did the uh, you know, the first read through. And in this, she's the harsh mistress of the castle. So I love that she was able to, to, to have this, you know, this scope, you know, with her the way she works and also understood herself enough to say, you know what, I can make this look super hard and hilariously, you know, scary looking. I, I love that she knew that about herself and that they allowed her to do that. To me, you know, in, in this age of Hollywood today where so many women are afraid to dress themselves down or ugly themselves up or whatever you know phrase you want to use to create the character, she fully embraced it. She took all of her acting chops and all the performance underneath and said, I'm I'm all in. I'm I'm becoming the character that the script calls for and totally unafraid to do that. 
I also get the feel that she was a good enough or is a good enough actress that she could have stolen a lot of these scenes. But she doesn't. She plays well with the other actors. Well, she must have done something because Gene Wilder ruined so many of her takes. She, well, we t- we yeah, talked about that uh, earlier this week. She mentioned in uh, behind the scenes in the making of this that they would have to take 20, some sometimes 15 or 20 takes on her that she would feel like some of her best work was left on the cutting room floor because Gene couldn't stop laughing. And I kind of get the sense from some of the some of the things I've read and heard that this is a sore spot for her. I think it was in, in telling, but I don't think when you go look at when they went to the 40th anniversary when Gene Wilder was still alive but wasn't able to make it, she was speaking fondly and having a fun time talking about it. I think, mm. yeah, her, I think that the I think the reception of this movie helped a lot of that. I think if this movie had been panned and she, her career hadn't kept going, she would look back on this as I did a plus work and B plus work is what you saw. But because her work shone through and everybody did so great, and this movie was so well received. It elevated her and she's come to peace with that. I think as, an, as any actor, if you're putting forth an effort and someone is constantly laughing and they are the writer and creator of this movie, there's not a lot you can do. You just have to go along with it at the time. Well, it's you funny because say anything. you hear the same type of aggravation and frustration from the guy who played Kramer on Seinfeld. You get the same thing from Michael Richards when he's talking about Seinfeld and you see it in some of the uh, outtakes and bloopers and things like that. He gets really mad at some of the other actors when they break and start laughing in takes. And there are a couple times he really let Jerry have it or you know the, some of the other actors because they kept laughing during the takes. And you kind of get that same feel a little bit from her, that it was really annoying and it, it really kind of it may have been more stepped on them. Back then, and, yeah. but I, do th- I really do believe it because, and I think Jonathan said it best, with how well received this movie right. has been, you look back fondly, you realize we were making a hysterical movie. And yes, I take myself seriously and I take my craft right. seriously. I can't really be mad Mad that Gene Wilder kept cracking up. It meant I was doing my job. Yeah, and it, and it shows the diversity of talent that was on on stage. That on she stage? Re- or on you know on, on set the, on set they really did take this very very seriously. Well, we've got as we start to wrap this minute up, we've got one of the best recurring jokes in this entire movie when she announces who she is. I am a joke I do with my wife all the time. <laughs> Anytime we walk into a room, someone will be like Frau Brucker. <laughs> I am Frau Bluka. And if you watch, and I love this, is, this shows me the craft of a, of a film actor. Rather than doing anything big, over the top, hammy, we're not talking a Jim Carrey here. Her face doesn't move, but her eyes, the minute she senses the horses rearing and start to whinny, her eyes cut sideways out of the corner. Of her, and I'm like, those horses are afraid of her. Yeah, th- it is a pain. She's done so, There's on something her face. more here yeah. with this horse and, and and the mistress of the household. There's something that made those horses fear her name. <laughs> yeah, yeah for a modern. For a modern take, I think of her as the Christine Baranski. Uh, I think Christine Baranski did her eye acting now. Like when, when Christine Baranski does uh, comedy, when she was in, for instance, uh, Bowfinger and movies like that, she's uh-huh. doing these eyes and she'll do these great takes where it's just a look. And that look is what drives the comedy. And I think if you look at her, Cloris Leachman, who, of course, did very well with Mel Brooks and Mel Brooks movies, Gene Wilder and Marty Feldman, all of them know how to use the pause and the look mm-hmm. of the eye to convey either the joke or the emotion of the scene. Because sometimes Gene Wilder can do it both from an emotional perspective, not just from a comedic perspective. And it's it's the eye acting. It's I read a good book a, a while ago as a film actor that was written that said what you have to learn in film versus stage is on stage you have to be loud because everyone has to hear you. But in film, you have to think loud. Don't be loud. Think loud. And the audience will understand because we're so close to your eyes. We'll know what you're thinking as long as you know what you're thinking. And it's obvious that she knows how to do this very, very well. Yeah. And so do several of the other actors. And you have to think that in the vision that they had for this film, Mel Brooks really got that and was able to bring that out of the actors in a really fantastic way. Well, looking at the script, it's amazing because we hear so many times in modern comedies how actors will just wing their lines and they'll make stuff up. And that happened in some of the scenes. But for the most part, I'm amazed how many of these jokes were conceived of, written and committed to page. And the actors delivered them just as Gene Wilder and Mel Brooks wrote them, including this entire Frau Bluka thing. It's it's exactly in fact in the script. It says, I am Frau Bluka. 
As the horses rear, Frau Bluka, Inga, and Freddy disappear into the castle, and Igoria or Igor, down, get down, you beast, down, I say. So, which is coming up in the next mm-hmm. minute on Monday, but it's exactly as conceived that the horses will constantly and throughout the rest of the script, anytime her name is mentioned, there is a stage direction. We hear the horses off stage whinnying. I, I love that. I love that payoff later on. When in a few minutes they're going to be inside the building, <laughs> and she's going to do it again. You hear them in the distance, and her face again. It's just like, are you kidding me? Like, how dare you? Yeah, I love that payoff. And this joke, this joke just starts here. This is the setup of this joke. And is this a good place to say this? Her name supposedly means Blue Factory. Is well, you, that that's the, actually not correct? <laughs> I know. I looked it up. It is not correct. <laughs> Apparently, though, Cloris Leachman asked Mel Brooks. I don't get the joke. Why are the horses whinnying when they hear my name? And because, yeah, these two young young guys just yucking it up in Gene Wilder's apartment saying, wouldn't this be really funny if? So they had to give her something. Mel Brooks just lied on the set and made up. He goes, well, it's because it's German for glue and horses know they get turned into glue. And so every time they say your name, totally not true. He just lied on the set to Cloris Leachman because she needed something to understand. Why is this funny? Why? Why is this funny? And she didn't get it. She honestly did not know. Why is this gag throughout this movie? Yeah. And it's, it's funny without the it's, it's funny without it anyway. Yeah. It's just funny. Right. <laughs> it's just so, hilarious. But yeah, no. For that somehow the horses sense her innate evilness and just winny every time she says her name. Exactly. Well, and, and, they think they're going to be killed or they think that someone else is going to. There's danger present. I love it. And that's to me what makes. A, a, a film memorable when you can read into it. Do they do that because she's been mean to them? Do they do that because they're a foreshadowing of her character? Do they do that because she's the evil one? It doesn't matter. You can have any any one of them could be right because of the way you look at it. That is yep. true. <laughs> <laughs> Long pause. <laughs> we, we were just amazed by your insight. Sorry. There we go. There, it took me until Friday. There's my one line of brilliance. After that, it's all BS. <laughs> yeah. Well, after you're not not understanding the difference between a cart and a wagon, we really had low expectations. So when you nailed that, it really just shocked us. I always have low expectations. <laughs> all right. Well, as we start to wrap up and, and wind down the week, which has been a, a really fast week for us here, we've gone all the way from the Transylvania station to the front door of the Manor von Frankenstein. Jonathan, is there anything that you have that we didn't cover that you want to talk about? Any behind the scenes stuff in your notes that we forgot to cover? No, we talked about everything. What knockers? What knockers? Thank you, Doctor. Oh, oh <laughs> those are real cobblestones they're running on. I think that's cool. I love no. set design that's like that. They did a very good job. And as we get into the interior, you met Jonathan, you mentioned that uh, earlier this week and in a couple of the episodes, I think, where you said it's cool to see the, the production design that went into this movie. And, and, and Mel Brooks, this goes back to the original story, why he wanted more money to make the movie, because he really wanted to capture that look and feel. And he didn't want to do it with painted sets and backdrops. He really wanted to build a castle looking set design. Yeah, it's great. I yeah. love it. Great authenticity. Walt, what do you anything you got that we forgot? No, I I think we've covered it, and I'm excited about next week, and I really appreciate Jonathan being here with us. Yeah, so let's thank our guest who's been with us all week long, Jonathan Howell with Minute Impossible. If somebody wants to dive into your podcast uh, or you know fly in from the ceiling and they try to steal the knock list, how do they do that? You can do that by downloading us on iTunes or anywhere your podcatcher works. We are on Minute Impossible on the internet. We are also on Min Impossible on Twitter. And you can also talk to us on our Facebook group at the Impossible Minute Force. We talk about everything from movies to mustaches. Right now, it's a very lot of mustache talk because with uh, Fallout coming out soon, we've uh, we've all fallen in love with Henry Cavill and his mustache. So join us there for that. Yeah, too bad it didn't work so well in the digital effects on uh, Dawn of Justice, huh? Yeah, he ruined a whole movie. Yeah. Well, yeah, he picked the right movie to actually keep the mustache That's in. the reason why that movie's bad, his mustache. Nothing else about that movie's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing at all. Huh. There's nothing good about that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so bad for the DC folks. They're trying so hard to get caught up to Marvel, and they just can't figure it out. Except for Wonder Woman. That's Wonder the Woman only one that knows I how to do say, it right. I saw Wonder Woman last night, and that's the exception. And a fun Wonder Woman tie-in, uh, Cloris Leachman paid, played Queen Hippolyta in 1975 on the Wonder Woman TV show. That's why we brought Jonathan Howell onto the Wilder Ride. Well, for our listeners, for the folks who said, you know what, I, I might stick around, come back another uh, another week of this uh, nonsense, how, how do people uh, find us? <laughs> well, for more of this kind of nonsense, you can go to facebook.com slash the Wilder Ride and spend some time with us there. Take some time to comment. If you have any insight that we didn't cover this week, please feel free to let us know that. Uh, and you can also find us on iTunes, which we really encourage you to go out and give us a five-star rating if you enjoy what you're hearing. Make a quick comment so your vote gets tallied. 
we really, really appreciate all the folks that have gone out there and uh, and told us what they thought. Absolutely. And our website, which has the links to everything, it's easy to remember, thewilderride.com. Go there. Check it out. See who some of our guests have been and who might be coming up. Learn a little bit more about us. And again, links to social media. Very cool place to be able to get you to where you want to go, depending on what, whether you like Twitter, Facebook, whatever. We appreciate you guys being out there. Jonathan, once again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy podcast to join us over here in our black and white old school world of young frankenstein no problem thanks guys hey thanks jonathan all right until monday where we're going to find out what happens inside of this castle von frankenstein we'll say frau bluka (laughs) (laughs) what knockers (laughs) thank you (laughs) (laughs) 